good evening and welcome hey to Hi Our Season 6, Episode 7 of Inside Recreate, where I'm joined by fellow Rook Andy Law and cartographer extraordinaire Mike Schley. Welcome to the stream, Mike. Hey there. Hi. Um, so we've How got loads of good thank you. How are you doing on this fine Saturday? We have a little bit of rain here. Feels uh, feels more like uh, Britain or the uh, Pacific Northwest right now. <laughs> it's also raining so, here, which is pretty much yeah. typical for Scotland. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to snow if we get any this year, but we'll see. Hopefully soon. Um, so uh, we've got lots of questions, as always, pre-submitted by patrons and on our Discord community. Um, but as always, there are people already in the chat. Um, please do ask questions if you're coming in in the chat. I note that Hawk Oddly got there before Seagoat this evening. So the race to be the first in the chat was um, Seagoat is usually the first and they were beaten. So sorry about that, Seagoat. You'll have to get up earlier next week. Mike, before we get yes. into those questions, would you like to give yourself a bit of an introduction as short or as long as you like, and then we'll jump right into the question. Sounds good. Um, so I uh, I guess I started working in the uh, game industry around uh, 2000. I've been uh, working in it for, I guess, 23 years now. Started with a company called Decipher in uh, Virginia. We were doing... Um, trading card games for Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, Star Trek. Uh, I actually got that job. I, I was in uh, art school first go around as an undergrad and uh, was running out of money and desperate to find a job. <laughs> Didn't have any digital experience whatsoever. Had a lot of drawing and painting experience and uh, lied on an interview <laughs> that I knew Photoshop. <laughs> and spent two weeks with a book because I couldn't, I didn't have enough money to purchase Photoshop. I barely even had a computer that ran. <laughs> um, so I spent two weeks with a crash course studying Photoshop, probably 10 hours a day, just memorizing hotkeys and uh, trying to figure out how to run, how to make art in a digital environment. And then uh, when I showed up, they sat me in front of a, you know, a, a monitor with a Wacom drawing tablet and told me, to, <laughs> they were like, hey, give it a shot. And uh, I had <laughs> honestly learned enough to work properly and, you know, do fairly well. I mean, they liked my, um, they liked my painting portfolio and mm. they were more than happy to, uh, you know, allow me to make a few flubs in a digital environment, but I fell in love with it. Even though I'd never touched a drawing tablet before, it, it was awkward, but I immediately fell in love with the process of learning because I love like learning new tools anyways. And most of my art is informed by my experience as a traditional artist. I love pen and ink and watercolor. And, but as a result of that, I ended up working there for, um, three or four years and made a series of moves, went out to um, Washington State, worked as an art director for um, Paizo Publishing when they were publishing Dungeon and Dragon magazine for a while. Got tired of being a paper pusher and uh, ended up doing a couple of maps for um, for d d Robert Lazaretti was the cartography manager over there. And I would send him jobs for um, Dungeon Magazine, and he came up uh, one month. He didn't have a cartographer for a um, uh, for one of their books, and asked me if I could fill in. And realized at that point, after the first job, that I really I much preferred making the artwork to assigning the artwork to other artists. <laughs> which I love seeing other artists' artwork. But I'm sitting here like wishing that I could actually do what I enjoyed rather than just managing uh, managing a magazine. That said, I love the guys that I worked with over at Paizo, and um, I still occasionally run into them at conventions or you know chat with them online. But um, so, anyways, that was in 2005, and I've I went ahead and um, gave them notice, and I've been making maps and scenes and artwork for the gaming industry for 20 years since. So was that uh, your first well, experience of being asked to draw maps? 
Because my... I was to see as asked, do you have dis some distinct memories of what drew you to cartography? Oh, to cartography specifically was as a kid playing D and D or collecting um, uh, collecting National Geographic's and having the fold out maps plastered all over my uh, all over my walls <laughs> in my uh, bedroom, um, and being just fascinated with space and how we interact with the world around us um, as both as a kid and as an adult um, both as an artist and just as a nerd that loves like understanding you know what that is you know or at least asking the question what is that I mean that's what drew me to, to art as well as to cartography and seeing seeing those stories sort of played out, in how the world around us is affected by just the physical process of living in the world is just exquisitely beautiful and interesting to me. So for instance, I live in a historic area of Philadelphia and I know you got <clears throat> I know um in the UK there's much more just tangible history in the environments that uh, uh that are around you in, in towns for instance, but here in in um, Philadelphia, one of the things that I noticed when I first, when my wife and I first moved into Old City, was that you can see where the history of the city has been sort of etched into the, like literally etched into the um, masonry of the buildings around us, and that there are sides of buildings that have the ghost imprints of buildings that once existed but are now mm -hmm. gone but you can see where the stairwells were and you know how the buildings were constructed and how how this how cities organically develop over time is immensely fascinating i live in a building that's about 200 years well yeah going on 200 years old um it was originally a uh horse clothier <laughs> so i've seen uh, wow. photographs from the mid 1800s where you see the front of the um the front of the and it's been converted now of course but you see the front of the building and there's this big horse mannequin with jackets that they used to sell from the uh, shop downstairs now it's a restaurant on the first floor and um apartments above but my floors like some of the floorboards are probably 200 years old and you can see the remnants of old fires that happened in the building probably 100 150 years ago from like the scoring on the uh, floorboards um yeah. so that that sense of place and history and how we build a picture of the world around us as a map whether that's you know a 2d like sort of top-down schematic or whether it's um like the way my wife navigates streets is she doesn't think of the streets as a top-down map but she definitely knows where landmarks are and mm -hmm. to me that's the same thing but in a different visual in a different sort of logical process so when when i'm thinking of a map and when she's thinking of the map they're two different things but they operate in the same way in that it's a method of navigating the world um so honestly when i'm when i'm drawing a map i'm thinking of it as a landscape and when i'm <laughs> drawing a landscape a lot of times i'm thinking of it as a map and those two things the dividing line between mm -hmm. those two things is very amorphous and sort of gray um so anyways. i had a, I had <laughs> I a like professor I'm... when i was at uni i had a professor of oh what was intelligent systems which was another way hmm. of saying he had monkeys in cages and and gave them little puzzles to do um hmm. but he he would always talk about um the the birth of writing and how his his belief was that writing had come out of the need for communication of where food was where you know hmm. where berries were where hunting was so his belief was that maps were essentially the first thing that humans would have written down for each other you know like even in the in the dirt to show where and and using exactly those things rather than saying right you go here to this rock and then you go there and then you go there that that cartography was the first form of written communication that was his belief i uh i i think i recall um 
Tolkien mentioned that uh, the first thing he did was uh, draw a map and then began uh, writing, you know, stories mm -hmm. like the to start with a map or to start with one's placement in the world and then tell stories about that um, or stories that sort of expand on on that understanding or to kind of have a map as a record of that interaction between oneself and the world around us. Um, yeah, is so Super timely that you should mention Tolkien because in the chat, Mark McGranahan has asked, um, cartography and fantasy storytelling are intertwined, thanks to Tolkien, I guess. Are there any yeah. other kinds of stories that rely so heavily on them? And are there any that should, but just don't because of genre conventions or whatever it might be? I, I think that there is, <clears throat> so I've done a lot of work for HarperCollins, Little Brown and Company, Scholastic Books as, in sheet maps on a variety of um, a variety of novels. Typically, they're either uh, young young adult novels, fantasy novels, um, like The Old Kingdom. Or I, I, I did uh, I did a series of world maps for children's books in the um, Wings of Fire series by uh, Tuiti Sutherland. Um, but it seems like. I would say that there is a sort of a prejudice towards maps or one one thing is that people assume that in true fiction you know true uh, literature you don't have a map well the for me the literature is the map you know but the visual map that's at, at the beginning of a book is sort of a visual cue uh um, I would like maps in in like books by like Pride and Prejudice, Jane Austen's oh, yeah. books, because Absolutely. I think that they like the size of Mr. Darcy's estate and the relation of Mr. Darcy's estate to the very small house that the, the Bennets live in. I think that's actually mm -hmm. like key to those books and and all of Jane Austen's books about class and, and, and size of estate, size of money. I definitely think that maps would really help help those books and I they're not traditionally agree. ones you would associate maps with. I, 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 I would absolutely I'll, agree. I'll, I was just about to say I agree also. I'm, I particularly agree as well because maps are there for more than one purpose. They're not just there to, let's take the classic fantasy example, to help you mm. understand where the fuck everything is. Pardon my French. But that's what it boils down to. When you're enter, entering into a fantasy world, you're really dealing with a whole bunch of stupid names with stupid hills and stupid creatures that really make no sense in the real world but are super cool. And you're trying mm. to contextualize that all. So often the, the first step is is well, where the hell is everything let's have ourselves a quick map but maps mm. do a hell of a lot more than that alone for example mm. with your your clear description there they tell a story which is i think to a degree what we we're discussing in terms of the name of this particular uh podcast for the day um where you've got that story between the large estate and the very small little building that's sitting over in the corner mm. and that power disparity um that can be given visually instantly yet also still be that important a uh, giver of information concerning the contextualization where all the locations are so it's providing mm. more than one single service towards the overall book there but to I, very quickly end on the question because i also feel like i'm going to answer that one but i'll be brief with a sentence um i think most books would benefit to a degree to break down what has been turned into a adult books don't need illustrations kids books do right. screw that i'm an adult and i like knowing what the characters look like according to the <laughs> author or where things sit and um, yeah. i still remember back to some of the books that i got as a kid very fondly and then the escapism that they provided when you no longer were tied to that art. Yeah, fuck that. One of the first uh, one of the first connections between visual art and um, sort of classic literature. Uh, when I grew up, my um, my dad had a huge collection of classics illustrated comics, mm. which were essentially just um, comic book format um, iterations of classic literature. And I still love listening to like the classic tales podcast or you know, it, being able to 
and I, I sort of take that sensibility to a lot of my uh, cartography in that I've heard people describe my sensibility as sort of low fantasy. And one of the, one of the things that I'm building my sort of epic atlas um, storyline around is taking a low fantasy setting and turning it on its head and then introducing magical realism in a way that's earth shattering uh like quite literally the first setup is um you know imagine <clears throat> imagine a world like earth set in the middle eight <clears throat> set in the middle ages except the moon is tidally locked and has been in a single point in the sky for as long as anyone can remember and then one day it starts to move and then everything starts to break down in the sense that the things that and i i wrote this sort of intro and started building this a couple of years before the pandemic so <laughs> it seems a little serendipitous or, or well I, I don't know if serendipitous is the right <laughs> word but the sense that the things that we hold on to as being stable and something to um sort of not even think about but just rely on uh, in general like without thinking can change or are changeable in ways that we did not expect. And then how do we as human beings living in this world, if the map changes or if, how do we actively go about making maps by living in the world and responding to things that we are not in control of? So in that, um, or with that sort of as the basis, can I whinge on in for just a few minutes about my thesis work in uh, grad I school? I love whinging. Go for it. <laughs> okay. So in, in grad school, which I just finished in uh, 2019, we were the last graduating class before the pandemic, which the next graduating oh. class didn't have a senior show, didn't like everything. Mm -hmm. You guys were there. Everything was thrown up into the, uh, into the air. But in... In the process of writing a thesis and creating a final show, I had to think about what was most important to me, not only visually or in the work that I do, but sort of fundamentally, what is important to me. Um, so I decided to make a painting and a series of uh, scu uh, a sculpture series that was essentially a changeable map, but it's 400 square feet um, in size, and it's five foot by five foot panels. 50, so imagine 16 five foot by five foot panels. And the reason that it's a five foot by five foot panel is that's the size of a human being generally when you stretch out your arms. Mm -hmm. And that relates to the grid in a typical D&D &D, um, style RPG. Does that's your space, right? So with 16 of these panels, essentially the way that I built it was such that, um, and if you go, I don't know if you wanna go check out my website, but if you go to mikeschlei.com, you can see these big color, color field uh, paintings. Um, essentially each of those paintings can be rotated in one of four directions so that the way that it was constructed, there are arcs of color and connection points between those color shapes that change or interact with the paintings beside them. Mm -hmm. So you can rotate these panels and reposition the panels and have essentially a countless varieties of ways that these can be displayed together. So it's constantly changing. And in my, uh, in my thesis show, essentially, there was one big room with 10 of these flanking the walls, a big stairwell in between, and me and my best friend are on both sides of the stairwell, rotating these panels and changing them out with other panels so that from the beginning of the show to the end of the show, it was a completely different painting. Mm -hmm. So if you could imagine life expressing itself as a map or trace the tracing of our actions in the world making the map um 
and how that is affected by the way that we treat one another or the way that we interact with the world around us. That to me is immensely fascinating. Um, I made a series of blocks. It, so I would have loved for visitors to the gallery to come and change the paintings on the walls. Of course, you know, gallery curators and uh, museum personnel don't particularly like that. So I instead, in addition to these big panels, I built um, 25 three inch by three inch by three inch blocks that operated mm -hmm. the same way as the panels on the wall cool. and put them on a table, built the box and had a little Im invitation um, to the guests to play. Um, and while I'm running around the gallery, moving these big paintings, I'm looking over during the show and seeing just visitors to the gallery sitting at that table playing with blocks. And it reminded me of children playing with blocks in a way that was fundamentally beautiful. And that's that's what I think about when I'm, you know, either part, you know, playing a when I'm sitting sitting down at a table with friends playing D D or playing any role playing game or any game, if I'm playing chess with a buddy of mine years ago, that interaction at the table as a collaborative storytelling process to me is um, there's something exquisitely beautiful in that and so whether whether i'm walking down the walking down market street or sitting at a table hanging out with friends or you know moving big panels in an art gallery <laughs> there's some there's a through line there that um that i find really uh really wonderful i've i've just a brief aside question on that one um because as i recall your maps in lords of waterdeep a board game we have played far too many yeah. times to bother mentioning um but one of the things that i always felt with that map was that it didn't integrate particularly well with the game itself it was it was almost nothing more than a backdrop and i always felt like mm -hmm. it could have been more is that, do you think, entirely unfair? And I'd be interested to see what your opinion is in this in comparison oh, to someone on very much on the outside. I, I don't. So when a, uh, when a client like Watsi asks for a piece of artwork, at a certain point, I have to let go of it and just give it to them <laughs> and how they interpret yeah. it or how they, what they build around it. I've got to be able to let go. And, mm -hmm. um, Sometimes folks uh, do better than uh, other times, in my opinion, as far as <laughs> integrating uh, integrating the artwork with the uh, with the gameplay. Um, Let's just leave that one there, then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> just in the chat, Move on there's, quickly. A, so, there's a lot in the chat about someone randomly, as everyone here is into maps, I'd love to hear thoughts on Polynesian stick charts. There's also been a lot Ooh. of chat about the first writing and how it was maths. Uh, it, just to go back, it, it, it wasn't writing that my professor was obsessed with. It was representations of the world. And, and if mm. you go back much further than the earliest writing, which is maths and finance and stuff, he was talking about, like, um, like uh, prehistory. Or cave paintings, pictograms, mm -hmm. yeah, and how how his view was that human intelligence relied on our gradual build up of pictorial and writing that took the effort out of the things we needed to remember. So, and and that was the difference he said between us and say monkeys, who every time they mm -hmm. came to a new puzzle started it again from scratch, whereas humans came up with strategies to remember mm -hmm. things in that puzzle. And the Polynesian stick charts are really interesting because. They're literally like pictorial ways of representing tides and islands that mm -hmm. that you couldn't possibly really see if you didn't know the language behind them that the Polynesian mm -hmm. people have have come up with together over generations. Absolutely. I think that history history is embedded in a fundamental way in the symbols that we share as cult cultural gr groups or just as human beings in general. Um, one of the things about the uh, cave paintings that um, that I've seen, just as art in and of themselves, they are so. There, I'm thinking of. I, I don't know if it's Lascaux or not, but um, there are cave drawings of lions and um, uh, some sort of buffaloes and things that are just as pieces of art are incredibly nuanced and 
the you know that the artist spent time intimately observing the world, you know, the, their subject, and then to be able to reproduce that in a dark wall with just and like really deep down fire light. Well. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. And, um, to and, be able to draw from the memory that clearly and to make those kinds of memories practice. requires, well, not only practice with the uh, with the tool, but okay. Here's here's a fascinating thing about that. So when I'm sitting around, when I'm sitting down drawing from observation, if the more time I spend looking at my page and the less time I spend actually looking at my subject the more generic and less interesting my drawing is going to be. So when I'm sitting in, when I'm sitting outside drawing from observation, or if I'm sitting in the studio drawing up from, from observation, as a percentage of where my eye is, the more I'm actually looking at my subject and just letting my hand go, which mm -hmm. has to come with practice, but the more I'm taking into account the little nuances of the thing that I'm not in control of, the more informed my drawing will be and the more interesting, in my opinion, the drawing is. So the folks that were down in the cave <laughs> spent so much of their time out in the world because I mean, that like that's what you did back <clears throat> 20,000 years ago. You're out living in the world, probably watching those, uh, those animals from a hilltop for hours and hours and hours, sort of intimately involved in a way that's, um, I feel like it's harder to do that nowadays because when we're out at the park, half the time we're, you know, myself included, half the time I'm looking at a phone, you know? Mm -hmm. So being able to, being able to go out and observe the world around me, that's, like that can't be replaced with a screen and that can't be sort of replicated. Yeah. Um, Mark says, um, full disclosure, I've spent several years as a postdoc in the Rock Art Research Institute. Um, I don't know where that is. Um, what, whatever university. So interesting to see Rock Art coming up here. Oh, Wits University. Like that's why I couldn't say it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I read a thing recently about how, how Rock Art, um, we see Rock Art with the um, static light of modern electric torches and rock, rock Art would have been observed with the flickering light of candlelight mm -hmm. and firelight to be a much more a, a dynamic much more experience that, yeah, yeah. to enable you to tell stories. But we should get to some of the pre-submitted questions because I've barely right. brought any of while, while you're pulling one up, I've got a small comment to make as well. And I think okay. that everything that's been said so far is neatly tied together by the concept of landmarks. Because right at the very beginning, um, Mike was saying that his wife uh, navigates using landmarks yeah. rather than specific maps and how language itself is doing nothing more than creating those landmarks in the mind by creating pictographs and something similar mm -hmm. to take you step by step by step. And they are all... Uh, in essence, that same process you're describing your uh, professor, was it professor, doctor, whomever yeah, it was, yeah. um, at a university creating those mental professor, maps. Funnily enough, his name was Professor McGonagall. So there well, you there go. you go. That, that ties in quite nicely. <laughs> professor McGonagall. <laughs> Potter. Um, and uh, yeah, and I think that all ties together really neatly because we're, even though we've alighted on several different subjects there, they are all neatly linked together by a ribbon that... Uh, gives us a little mind map that we can follow through showing how they are all basically the same thing and i quite like that anyway yep. i shall move aside yep. um so seagull asks they say a picture is worth a thousand words have you produced any maps or other drawings which are the ultimate visual reference for the story oh the ultimate visual reference for ultimate. The story. i think the story <laughs> is the ultimate visual reference like the imagination is the ultimate visual reference for the story um i can Hmm. I can say that the map, when a map's integrated with the story, it's, there's something that happens in the imagination of the reader that no matter what the author writes, no matter what I draw, mm -hmm. where that story t is told is in the mind of the reader or the mind of the person sitting at the table, or it's in your mind, <laughs> you know? And 
I can give story seeds in maps. I can give little um, uh, little ideas of how that story will be told. Um, here's so when I had to describe the blocks or these big panels, what was interesting to me, I mean, I, I can make big, beautiful artwork and I make, I can make big, beautiful maps, but the thing that I can't make that is most important to me where the story actually occurs is in the freedom of the mind of the person that's sitting at the table across from me to do something that I cannot do with what I've made. Like there's something that's irreplaceable in that. So I can make a big, incredibly rich map. I just finished. There are so many maps that I can't talk about because there's no ah, other NDAs. NDAs. <laughs> <laughs> so I have, I just recently, I worked on, um, yeah, all I can say is I've, I, I'm currently. You worked on a job and it was fun. Working on <laughs> maps that, like everything, including the kitchen sink, is in it. So in that sense, like, I don't think that, it's like, can you draw a map as big as the world? Well, it wouldn't be a map. It would be the world, <laughs> you yeah, know? Yeah. Um, so as a shorthand, maps can sort of provide you with the tools for your own imagination to play with. And that's that's all I can really do. And that's, all, you know, that's all I have time to do. And that's my job. That's like what I find, what I find fascinating and doing the best, well, paying attention as closely as possible to what I'm doing so that like, I hate cutting corners and it takes me a long time to draw my maps. That said, I've got thousands of maps that I've produced over the last 20 years. Um, I do like if anybody knows my style, I do spend a lot of time trying to give as much visual content to play with without it being sort of too much. So understanding like how to uh, how to show understanding how to show content or how to build a map that's visually compelling, uh, useful and still sort of design wise readable is a balance. It's overwhelming. Yeah. yeah. I'd say in, in fact, of all the things that if I were to sum up my single comment regarding your work that I have seen, and I've seen quite a lot of it over the years, I'd say one of your, not just core strengths, but one of your extraordinarily strong core strengths is your ability to convey lots of complicated matter in a relatively small number of strokes to ensure that everything is conveyed and that the imagination can be sparked without ever being overwhelmed. There are so many similar images out there where the visual noise just gets in the way. Um, and you often dispense of this visual noise with a flick. And uh, I'm not going to depict that part at all. I'll just drop it down into an almost watercolor slip to give the impression of everything that could be there. They, I actually learned from you um, the, some of the mistakes I was making in terms of presenting just roof tiles, where often you'd go, yeah, no, um, no, no, stop. I'll just go flick, flick, dot, 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 flick, 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 dot, 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 done. And I looked at it and I went, ah, oh, shit, I'm doing that wrong. That's better. Um, and, and that for me was, that for that for me was super exciting as a step because you get stuck in ruts. You get yourself used to doing particular ways of depicting things mm -hmm. and then seeing someone do it a different way and going, shit, that's better. It's just brilliant. Um, and it ended up making me go away and go, I'm going to go and look at some more of these and had a little flick through and I went, look at that. That's really easy stroke, really difficult to do um, because it's really easy in terms of the core construction of the lines, but really difficult in terms of which lines are the ones you're going to choose to depict. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At least that's what I found. So I'm uh, I dot my 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 cap to you. Your, your dark angel's cap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so a lot of that actually comes from my background in the visual arts. Um, 
and a lot of that's from just understanding that less is more and mm -hmm. spending time with you know a brush pen on paper and knowing like how like my wacom tablet like i go through nibs pretty <laughs> frequently and yep <laughs> that those small motor skills in the hands um yeah yeah knowing uh it, a lot of times you know i'll a lot of times i'll make a stroke two or three times with my left hand on the apple z uh, hotkey just to uh just just until i get it just right because i think with one little stroke you can say so much more than with you know a dozen sort of yeah. fidgety strokes um i think there's a uh and then like if you one of the things that I'm constantly doing is backing out and zooming in on a uh, on a map. And I think not only in the creation of the map, but when you're when you're thinking about a map, I think we do that in that there's a overview sort of God's eye perspective. But then there's a very intimate granular view where we tell human stories in that map. Um, and in that image that I think having that, having that balance, um, sort of play well together, uh, mm -hmm. is really important to me. And I think that shows in the, um, it, one of the reasons that I'm sort of minimal in what I choose to depict is because I'm constantly backing out and seeing if that granular detail is becoming, um, too much or overloading. Yeah. Yeah, totally. because you've got to be able to see you've got to be able to see what it is you're looking at from a distance to understand that. Um, yeah, to not uh, to not feel like you're being overwhelmed. Um, we were raided by World Anvil, Light Up the Forge. So um, okay. let's have a little question about world building. Isla C mm -hmm. Deceiver asks, are there specific traps that aspiring world builders should be wary of? Or are there specific touches you have or have observed that you think are worth sharing with us? Such I a broad think, question. I, well, no, I, also, I think that that directly oh, yeah. relates to the previous conversation or the yeah. conversation we were just having in that you can throw everything in there, but if you don't have like the intimate stories that engage people as human beings, you're just going to pass it right over. Um, for instance, I could tell you that... Uh, like, okay, here's here's a perfect, for instance, I could show you a map of Old City, and I could show you a map of my building, and I could show you a map of Fork Restaurant downstairs, right? But there are things that happen in that space that can only be expressed through story and maybe through very selective choices of what would appear in that map right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so can i tell you a story about yes, something please. really yes, strange please. and wonderful and interesting that happened to me my wife and i just a few years ago so <clears throat> downstairs we have a uh, uh, james beard awards winning restaurant it's one of the best restaurants in town it's called fork which I love, by the way. I'm presuming there's spoon and knife located at a key <laughs> other points in the city. It might be. They have they have uh, two or three uh, two or three other uh, restaurants in town, but they're they're absolutely fantastic. A little pricey, but you know, when uh, Jill and I first moved into uh, into the apartment, um, I was kidding that we should cut a hole in the floor and get a dumbwaiter installed because their food. <laughs> <laughs> drop it right down to the uh, kitchen. So, anyways, they had they have this big uh, ventilation fan that's in the back of the building. It's right behind our back windows. One day, this big fan blade got off kilter and starts scraping the metal housing around the, the around the blade. And if you could imagine, at midnight or at eleven o'clock at night, this fan screaming sound coming through our uh, apartment. Yeah, that was a little concerning. <laughs> So um, the next day, like it, it, it cut off, but it was annoying. I mean, it was like nerve wracking. So the next day I talked to uh, the owner, Ellen Yen, and uh, 
it's like you got to come upstairs because you can't hear it as well like down in their restaurant but you can hear it like a freight train up in our uh, up in our um, apartment so she comes up and it's like oh this is terrible and immediately the next day or later on that day uh, has it repaired and so it was fine but anyways in the process she offers us dinner and <clears throat> she offers us dinner at the restaurant and um so jill and i plan a dinner date um dinner and a movie a couple of weeks later we go there and we have absolutely the best meal of our lives it was the full tasting menu and then they just kept bringing out more food we finished with a, an aged porterhouse steak that was probably the best steak i've ever eaten in my, in my life and they kept bringing out the booze so we had a wonderful <laughs> time right <laughs> And what, uh, movie, then we, what movie? What movie so did you we see? So we went. So we left there and went to the movie. And um, we we have a nice little theater just down the road, like maybe a block, a couple of blocks mm -hmm. down. It was we watched M Night Shyamalan's Glass. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I don't know if anyone's seen it or not. I mean, it was filmed here in Philadelphia. Like he films a lot of his movies in Philadelphia, and it just happened to be out in the theaters. And it was like the only thing that was showing that we were sort of halfway interested in checking out. So uh, Jill and I go to the show and an hour in, we're watching, we're watching the, uh, we're watching the movie. And so there's a little, there's one scene where there's a, uh, you can hear in the background there's a large group of people there's sort of clattering of forks and cutlery and things and people are chatting and it sounds like a busy busy restaurant but the view start the the scene opens with a tight shot of a little two top that doesn't have it that's set up for company right for somebody to uh, come and sit but there's there's nobody there the camera pans out the whole restaurant's full that's the only table that's empty. As the camera pans out, my wife's like punching me in the shoulder. Mike, Mike, Mike. <laughs> that was the same table we were sitting at one hour. <laughs> oh my God. It was like we had walked out of the movie yeah. to come watch the movie. And I don't know yeah. if you can tell that in a map, but you can't tell it in a map if you're just throwing everything on the, uh, on the floor and saying, all right, you know, have at it. It's something that happens, like, I couldn't draw a map of what happens at the gaming table over the course of a five-hour, six-hour gaming session, but I can remember it and I can be there for it in a way that I think creates a mental palace of memory yeah. that we sort of interact, I don't know if it's what we use to navigate the world or if it's created by us navigating the world and interacting with the world. Mm -hmm. But again, there's something slippery and beautiful in that, that we've talked about, we've yeah. talked about that before, Mike, where like Andy and I played a vampire campaign for like 10 years and we played a Warhammer campaign for 10 years and with the other Andy. And there's some people in this real world who we can talk to about, I don't know, the Siebenbergen in Transylvania and Codlia and, and, and the old district, the dock district of Marseille. And they know what we're talking about but we've never mm -hmm. been there together and we've never done anything but imagine it in our minds and yet mm -hmm. it feels real like to me the warhammer world we've played in it so much like Dieter's mm -hmm. Haven is as real a place to me which is where one of my characters came from as Marrakesh is I've never been to Marrakesh yeah. either I know it exists I might have seen pictures of it but I've spent more time in Dieter's Haven imagining it and thinking about it and building it with Andy mm -hmm. than I have in Marrakesh. So for me, Dieter's Haven is more real than Marrakesh. Right. <laughs> Which I, is uh, weird. It's, I would say that we have, we have the ability, which is, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I think that other higher, um, well, other animals that like dolphins and uh, great apes, that, like they can create or have really distinct visual memories and um, like whales, for instance, I would think that they 
just by listening to their songs and seeing how they relate to one another, they have these pictures of the world that are probably incredibly beautiful and incredibly detailed and, and rich, right? So I don't know that my, hmm, I could tell you that my experience of Fork Restaurant is much different than anyone else's experience of Fork Restaurant. And I can say that for me, that experience is my reality of for like my experience is real in the sense that you know Joe and I were really there and it really happened someone else like if i just tell that story to them they weren't there and they can try and visualize it but they have their own experience with fork restaurant or you know in that mm -hmm. if they've been there they have their own experience with that space so for them their experience is real that said, you know, if I go downstairs to Fork right now, I'll have a different experience with the food that they serve and the people that are there. And so for me, my, my memory is real and my experience with things that I don't imagine that, but that are right there in front of me that I, you know, like you're not my imagination, <laughs> you are real, right? So I hope so. Me, sure. Trump, let's, yeah. for, for the sake of this argument, let's say yes. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, that takes precedence over my imagination of who you are, right? In yeah, other words, yeah, the people yeah. that are sitting at the table are more important to me than any, you know, anything that comes from me. So I think that in collaborative storytelling or in collaborative experiences, say over a map at a table, there is something exquisitely beautiful that has nothing to do with, I, need, I don't even know that it has anything to do with the map. So when someone asked me, what my thesis was about and i was thinking about the blocks that i spent freaking hours and hours and hours and hours working on they literally asked me okay so they they asked me whether there was anything that the person at the table in playing with the blocks could do or whether i so the most difficult thing for me was to be able to let go of those blocks or let go of those mm -hmm. paintings and not dictate what the other person was going to do with them, right? You don't tell kids yeah. how to play with blocks. You've got to be able to let go. Mm -hmm. So for me, that is fundamentally the most difficult and most important thing that we could do in sitting down at that table. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of metaphorical <laughs> stuff going on there, but um, the blocks and the map and the artwork, the things that I make as an artist are nowhere near as important to me as the person that's viewing it on the other side of the table and what they, what the fact of what they do being what they do and not Can, what i wish that they would do yeah so authorial intent has done taken the second part yeah yeah totally yeah. i i can't agree with this more in fact we've sort of discussed around this yeah, several we, times yeah. in the past um and by that i mean we've discussed how maps um they are a flashpoint for the imagination and the books that are they're in typically the role-playing books when we're discussing the gaming uh, industry as a whole and they are not there to tell stories they are there to give other people the tools to tell their stories um, and maps in particular are extremely powerful mm -hmm. for this because they provide frameworks and shapes mm -hmm. and uh, visual 
codes that all of the players can interact with. So they all understand the basic starting point. Um, and depending on the map, that map may have lots of tiny little details which spark the imagination in a variety of different ways, like playing a game of Dixit and attempting to interpret what the individual images mean. But when they then take that away, and they take it to their own imaginations and their own tales that they will spin at their own tables. It becomes something new, something beautiful, and something that stands significantly apart from the art that inspired it. And it's such an interesting space for art in, in general because it is mm -hmm. art that is specifically designed to inspire immediately, not to be thought about over the course of time and then come back on 20 years ago, but to create new stories with, which will in turn be the points that are remembered, which is, is super cat? fascinating. Is there, yes, there is. There a cat? A cat <laughs> yes, that, <laughs> that's, uh, that's Wazo. We have a, um, we have a uh, male, uh, female bonded pair and we were oh. teaching ourselves French at the time. So the the female's name is Petite, and uh, the male's name is Wasso. <laughs> so it's a little bit, uh, I like that. Um, Jill and I would we would uh, sit at the park and uh, you know feed bits of our uh, croissant to the little sparrows that would come up. So we had to learn uh, little bird, and then we wandered down to the uh, pet store or to the rescue shelter and came home with a couple of cats. So we knew. Aww. Ah, oh, oh, that cat just looks, pounds. just looks angry. Like, <laughs> why are you, why are you doing this to me? I think she's, uh, yeah, he's he's uh, angling for uh, treat time. I fed him early, but uh, he's yeah, he's gonna be uh, crawling on top of me in about 20 or 30 minutes. Do you guys, do you guys have cats? Yeah, we've got Studio two cats. Um, yeah, we've got two cats and two children. Um, <laughs> the the <laughs> cats Europe are a, a Siberian forest cat, and he's almost seven, and a Norwegian forest cat. She's only six or seven months. She just got spayed this week, so she's been in her little suit. Um, she's just got her suit off, but they're massive, massive fluff balls. They are. We, uh... <clears throat> we had a uh, we had a dog years ago, and uh, I I think we're well we're just about to have our uh, twenty year anniversary. So uh, oh, I mentioned that, but uh, it's, for me that's <clears throat> we um, we don't have any uh, don't have any kids, but uh, we spoil our cats rotten as if they were as uh, you should. Uh, this is only right and proper. Yeah, we spoil our cats. Our kids can just sort themselves out. Like. <laughs> 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 um uh given the well, hour we should spit we should speed through the next few well um, uh, this okay. is interesting because kilishandra asks but i just want to go back to something oh you this said, is a good right? one actually have you found a good solution to mapping multi-layers like warren's mines and holds but i was just thinking when you were talking about dolphins and whales like how their mental maps with their that they presumably create with sonar like a oh, map yeah. of the ocean from a dolphin or a whale's perspective would be so different it would be more like like a bird's map of the sky then it would be our map of the world because it would be so full of volume because it's so three-dimensional so have you found any good solutions to mapping those kind of multi-layers like warren's mines and holds so i i did a map of uh skullport which is a town underneath um underneath waterdeep and that was probably the most difficult map I've so ever hard. Put on. Because <laughs> I drew it, I drew it in perspective, not as a top-down map, but um, being able to show the it, being a, being able to show the depth of that city, or being able to show multiple uh, multiple layers, um, like a lot of times I'll use cutaways. Um, a lot of times I'll just think about how how I'm designing the actual layout to best or to most optimally show to show that depth otherwise like for my okay so for um for the first episode of my uh the, or for the preview chapter of my uh, patreon there's a map called the uh, the forlorn cottage and that's got um you know ground floor plan basements underground uh, like a little underground 
um, borough and then a second floor. Um, and the only way that I've, the only way that I've been able to figure out how to do that is with multiple images so that there's a cutaway and there are separate maps that link to the main floor plan. But doing it in a single image is a tall order. <laughs> Um, I'm happy to say I have not yet found a solution that I like. I found lots of solutions and I have depicted them in a variety of different ways, all of which have ended up leaving me slightly frustrated. Whether it's hmm. taking isometric views to try and give that idea of depth, whether it's taking side elevations or plans or both with cutaways or some equivalent to try and give that idea of the volume that you're dealing with rather than just the individual planned areas where the PCs, groups or whatever might be making their way through. But particularly for, um, to pull on that question um, alone, for something like a hold or a city, which also has depth, and it's not just one or two steps, but it's actually mm -hmm. multiple levels. Yeah. God, there's just not a good way of doing it outside of a 3D well, program. Um, yeah, and, and 3D programs are brilliant. But, oh. but yeah, it's a 3D image and it, and it changes. And once it's a 3D image, it's mm, chef's kiss, beautiful, but trying right, right, to put right. it into a 2D area, God, it's tough. <laughs> it's actually it hard. It 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 absolutely takes multiple pages. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, giving a sense of the DM's perspective, which you can do isometrically or from an aerial view, um, and then having like being able to combine that with having a um, top-down layout that would show each of the uh, each of the separate levels, and then having. Uh, player or character views that would give you a sense of what it actually feels like to be standing in that space. Mm -hmm. um, all of those combined could add or could bring you into a more, bring you to more of a resolution um, of that issue. But, you know, it's, yeah, it just freaking takes work. Yeah, <laughs> and it's hard, hard, hard. Yes. hard. <laughs> Seagull Which... asks, Andy Law says he draws maps. <laughs> Do you have any pro tips for him? <laughs> uh, don't uh, don't cut corners. Just suck it up and yeah. do the work. That's if I could leave yeah, you. Andy. If I could leave one thing, AI sucks. You got to mm. do the freaking work. Do the work. Don't matter. Uh, don't worry about whether it's taken a long time. The best work takes time. Absolutely. So many boxes. <laughs> um, so and here's many little one boxes. From Seagull, because you mentioned, <laughs> you mentioned old school, new school. So what medium do you prefer to draw with? Are you dedicated to maintaining old school pen and ink maps or do you embrace all this new technology, which is not exactly new now, Seagull, to be fair. I, you know, <laughs> I really enjoy working with pen and ink um, and doing watercolor washes. Um, I love painting. Like, that to me is enjoyable because, well, I, I could I could list I well, I just really like it. And technology, you know, I love I love working in Photoshop. Um, yeah, me if too. Other people Control find band. mediums that they really enjoy, and that's fantastic. More power to them. Do wonderful work. But for me, I mean, that's like my style. People, I get a lot of people that say, I saw the artwork and instantly knew who it was by, right? Mm -hmm. Because I've, I've limited myself into how I go about doing things because, you know, those constraints are what give our work flavor. Those channels that we choose to work in that we find enjoyable and interesting are... Mm -hmm our signature. And even though, even though I'm working with a tablet um, in a digital environment where I have a ton of tools, there are moves and My nuances brain. that I use that I love that show up in the, in the work, you know, and <laughs> I'm I'm just, a, I'm I have 4 million okay. tools. I use six. Yes, um, <laughs> exactly. I don't have I time have. to use a million tools, and I no. like the six tools that I have. So, yeah, that's, <laughs> and that's why I still use much, Photoshop. Yeah. Yeah. We're yeah, pretty. Yeah. We are pretty much on um, 
Oh, we're at the our final hour already. Minute. Yeah, we're at our oh. hour already. Thank you, Mike. I could have. I think we could have talked for. We've got so many hours. More questions that we didn't get yeah, to. We could have absolutely. talked for hours. Thank you for all your stories. I feel like I've had a real glimpse into your. Um, yeah, I feel like I've got a, a better image of Philadelphia in my head now than I had at the start, and that is. <laughs> well, you'll have to come great... visit. Yes, if you're absolutely. Ever in the US. And, and same in return, please do come and see us in Edinburgh because I think you'd Absolutely. like Edinburgh. It's got, it's a very unique An city in the way that it's built marvel. architecturally. It's really lovely, yeah. I'd love to show you around. Um, so that, uh, consider that a standing invitation. Thank you very much. Um, but on that note, uh, thank you so much, as always, to our lovely Discord community, to our patrons. We really appreciate all your support, and we couldn't do Inside the Rookery without you. Thank you so much to Andy for being my cartography chat partner today. And Hello. thanks most of all to our <laughs> viewers and to Mike for bringing all their lovely questions and to Mike for um, answering them in such fascinating stories. Um, until the next time, until next week. Goodbye to the chat room. Goodbye to you all. Goodbye to Mike and Andy. Remember to press like, share, subscribe, and all of those things. And we will see you next week for another Inside the Rookery. Good night. Coo -coo, coo -coo. Good night. <laughs> Bye.